Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's uh, Friday the 6th of May. Now, if you're struggling for time, I'll give you a quick uh, rundown on what this video is about. The excess deaths during the first two years of the pandemic, that's 2020, 2021, uh, were 14.9 uh, million. And, and if we add the data for 2020, Two, we can safely say that it's over 15 million deaths now. The official death figure of reported deaths is 6.2 million. And just a couple of interesting highlights that's come from this data. The proportion of deaths in men has been higher than women in terms of overall um, mortality, excess mortality. And there's been more deaths proportionately in high income countries compared to low income countries. So quite interesting, really, and things we were really desperate to know about a couple of years ago, they're now sort of coming to light and we can we can sort of see this pandemic in its context much more accurately. So moving on to a bit of detail there, official reported deaths. Now, that's from this site here, uh, which is pretty good. World Health Organization site. I've put the link there. Hover over a country of interest and it will give you, uh, well, nearly a million deaths there in the United States. Uh, officially reported deaths the excess deaths is higher than that it'll give you the global situation half a billion uh, officially reported cases 6.246 uh, officially reported deaths as we said a gross underestimate and then it will give you the the detail for uh, countries as well in terms of cases and deaths so pretty good uh, pretty good site really really uh, quite uh, um, sophisticated levels of information and the graphics these days are really very, very good. So you can look at the graphics broken down uh, over time and then it's got further breakdowns uh, if you want it. So, um, and th they're the figures from there, uh, 6.2 million official deaths. Now this um, excess deaths data comes from uh, this group here because it's always good to look at the validity of the of the data so this is the group here it's the technical uh, advisory group on COVID-19 uh, mortality assessment and there's information about them there and if you go on um, it tells you there's basically five working groups here and if we look at working group one for example we see we've got full transparency we can see who these people are so this is good so we've got Professor uh, Bradshaw there as the chair and then we have the various uh, members all uh, pretty impressive uh, academics and uh, statisticians and highly relevant people. And this, of course, is just working group uh, one. Um, it, it goes on. Um, pretty, pretty, um, pr pretty impressive, really, that they put all this together. So the World Health Organization, of course, would criticise them many times. The leadership... Uh, some of the decisions of the leadership are open to question, of course, we know that. But what you might call the sort of the rank and file, the, the workers of the World Health Organization, well, they are they are world leading people. So um, and and uh, lots of them. So uh, but I'll, I'll leave you to, to, to browse that. It's a bit of a who's who of the field, really. Um, so that's um, that's how this information was derived. And that was just group one. Uh, convened jointly by the WHO and the United Nations Department of Economic and Social uh, Affairs. <clears throat> now, the methods they use, also pretty uh, sophisticated. Let's look at some of the methods that they use. So they're, they're the uh, data for that, the, the information for that. And again, full details on the methodology. So what this really amounts to is a pretty uh, sophisticated paper, really. Uh, it's just in different bits and bobs, but it's all, it's all there. And it, it is an impressive piece of work. So methods there, and then uh, for the more numerically minded of us, which I'm not really, um, a lot of detail there on um, the, the methods that they use. So very transparent process. Um, now, I don't pretend to be familiar with all these modellings here, but it's uh, standard uh, epidemiolog epidemiological and statistical uh, practice. But they've actually enhanced some of the ideas to try and get information uh, where there is information deficits to try and not exactly extrapolate or interpolate, but to, to, to give the most concise estimates possible of areas where data is simply missing. So that is uh, the methods used and it's all... 
it's all very high caliber uh, material 14.9 million deaths so this is the actual uh this is the actual paper here from the who where they report 14.9 million excess deaths associated with the covid pandemic and as we say this is just 20 and 21 uh, the data for 2022 not yet uh, fully uh, compiled and already at 14.9 million um, so it would have been fascinating to know this a couple of years ago but of course uh, that was not possible um, full death toll associated directly or indirectly with the pandemic so this is the this is the excess deaths remember so this is direct deaths indirect deaths excess mortality uh, for the full two years uh, January 2020 to the 31st of December 2021 now their confidence range is uh, 13.3 <coughs> 13 million to 16.6 uh, million but they're estimating 14.9 million excess deaths Dr Tedros of course has to chime in uh, these sobering data not only point to the impact of the pandemic but also the need for all countries to investigate more in more resilient healthcare systems. I mean, obviously, who, who can disagree with this? That can sustain essential health services during the crisis. Of course, I mean, even, well, not even, probably you could argue, especially in America and the United States, uh, ordinary healthcare was simply not carried on during the pandemic. And that's, that's a big cause of the, the excess mortality, of course, that healthcare has been absent uh, now this this um, paper here does actually focus quite a lot on the deficiency of uh, quantitative uh, data gathering from various places it focuses on that as a as a as a fairly major deficit and if you actually read the, the whole the whole the details of it um, it does make sense that they have got a pretty valid point here um so we're needing uh, stronger health information systems. That was Dr. Tedros. Generate better data for better decisions and better outcomes. So it's not academic. It's to inform decisions and to give us better outcomes. The data is necessary. So excess mortality, the number of deaths that have occurred uh, and the number of deaths expected in the absence of a pandemic. Now, this is gathered in different ways in different countries. Um, in the UK, typically, we take the average of the last five years or the five years before the pandemic. In different countries, it's done in different ways. And, and the team were able to account for this to, to a fairly high degree using different uh, adjustment techniques and modelling uh, techniques. So this is, the best, this is the best data we have. Um, so direct and indirect death. So a direct death would be someone dying of a, of a coronavirus infection. An indirect death would be someone dying of a so it's a, an appendicitis or a heart attack that, that wasn't treated because of the pandemic or as a result of the economic implications of the measures that were taken to combat the pandemic. Now, this doesn't, it doesn't tease this out yet. It's going to be very interesting to find out how many of these, uh, what we might call collateral damage, these indirect deaths are due to people, for example, not directly getting health care, but how many are actually caused by uh, sometimes inappropriate restrictive measures during the pandemic. For example, in some poorer countries, people weren't able to eat for, for several days at a time because their income uh, for that day is what buys the food for that evening. And uh, very often that was in inhibited by the, um, the extreme uh, lockdown measures that were instigated in, in many circumstances due to the pandemic's impact in health systems and society as, as a whole. Healthcare systems have been overburdened. As we know, that's probably the major factor in, in, the, in the richer countries. Now, deaths can be averted during the pandemic as well. There's been less motor vehicle accidents, less occupational injuries, and especially during the first part of the pandemic, there was a lot less pollution atmospheric pollution the problem with pollution in this world is huge atmospheric pollution water pollution um, uh, India particularly I've, I've spent a bit of time working in uh, New Delhi uh, in India and, and I always get a chest infection there um, the, the pollution is so bad um, it's terrible and recently there's been a fire in a rubbish heap which has made it even worse these ongoing problems they actually got better for some time particularly in the start of the pandemic so that is interesting and more data to come from that, I'm sure. 
Um, most of the excess deaths, 84% were in Southeast Asia, Europe and the Americas, um, less so in uh, Oceania, Australia, Antipodes and uh, Africa. Now this is interesting, very interesting. High income countries, 15% of the total 14.9 million deaths. Low income countries with very low vaccination rates. 4% of the total 19, uh, 14.9 million deaths. So that's 15% of 14.9 million, 4% of 14.9 million uh, excess deaths. And again, this has got things to tell us. So richer countries tended to keep all the vaccines for themselves, but they've ended up with an overall higher um, overall mortality rate. I think we've got a lot to learn from that when this is more unpicked. Uh, but at the moment, it's just pretty crude uh, overall uh, figures. Um, sex, uh, males, 15.7% of the 14.9 million. Females, 43% uh, of the 14.9 million. Now, this is partly attributable to the COVID itself, of course, but there's clearly other factors. So uh, more men than women have died during this uh, two-year period. Now, I think I'll just show you a, a graphic because this varies quite a bit, of course, by uh, individual countries. So here we have um, here we have excess mortality, cumulative deaths from all causes compared to projections based on previous years. Now, that's the zero line there. Now, up until recently, um, Australia has been below the zero line. It's actually had less deaths than normal, which is great. It's just starting to peak above that line now, unfortunately. New Zealand is still below it. Denmark, and remember these are, these are uh, cumulative. So Denmark, which abolished all restrictions oh, quite, quite some time ago now, uh, is stopping the vaccination program from the 15th of May or suspending it altogether. Uh, very low excess deaths then Canada, then Germany, then the United Kingdom, and then unfortunately the United States, um, high levels of excess death during the period in the United States above uh, 15%. So, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, what are people saying about this? Assistant Director for Data Analysis and Delivery, WHO. Measurements of uh, excess mortality is uh, an essential component to the understanding of the impact of the pandemic. Yes. Uh, shifts in mortality trends provide decision-making information to guide policies. This is the key thing. Decision-makers to guide policies. The decision-making has not always been good. The policies have not always been good, to put it mildly. To reduce mortality and effective, uh, effectively prevent future crises of course is good we need to learn about the future as we go along because of limited investment in data systems in many countries um, the true extent of excess mortality is often uh, remains hidden but as we say this group did a very good job at estimating it uh, these new estimates uh, use the best available data and have been produced using a robust methodology uh, and uh, a completely transparent approach which as we've seen is true so I'm going to give the World Health Organization a big tick on this. In fact, I'm very happy with this. I'm going to give it a, a big red tick as well. Uh, the question marks from the World Health Organization is not the quality of the individual uh, workers. Um, it's the there are question marks over the uh, uh, over the leadership and the more strategic decision. But in actual terms of collecting data on the ground they are the best that we have uh, in the world these people are uh, usually the, the well they, they are they are the best people at doing this um, so uh, dr fall assistant director for emergency response the uh, data is foundational uh, of our work every day to promote health which is what we want to do keep the world safe and uh, serve the vulnerable of course, hard to disagree with these statements, but they are useful summaries. Need to track outbreaks in real time everywhere. This is the thing. This data now that we're looking at, um, it's not real time. It goes up to the end of 2021. And we've had to wait 
two and a half years into the pandemic to, to get it. Um, you'd think with all the mobile phones in the world and all the sophisticated um, technology that we have now, you'd be able to track things much more quickly. Uh, we, we need uh, information technology systems that can actually communicate with each other while still preserving the autonomy of the individual. And this can be done. Um, the NHS collects a lot of data and the, the autonomy of the individual is uh, protected. This can be done. It's open to abuse by uh, despotic uh, dictatorships, of course, which is the problem. Um, but it can be done. Humanity has the potential to do this. Uh, now, we know where the gaps in the data are. So the big gaps in the data are known about. So United Nations Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, the United Nations system is working uh, to deliver uh, an authoritative assessment of the global total uh, toll of lives lost from the pandemic. And it is getting more accurate. And we have looked at other papers in the past which gives uh, more uh, localised breakdowns, as indeed this screen is just a sample, a sample uh, of that. Um, this work uh, is an important part of the UN uh, DEA strategy, um, DESA strategy, <laughs> uh, ongoing collaboration with uh, WHO and other partners to improve global mortality estimates which is good, but only useful uh, if it feeds back into decisions, policy, preventing the mortalities and preventing mortalities in the future. Um, and director of the statistics division of the United Nations, um, data deficiencies make it difficult to assess the true scope of the crisis with serious consequences for people's lives. They are really um, going quite strongly on this, that this lack of information uh, has got pragmatic implications. The pandemic has been a stark reminder of the need for better coordination and data systems within countries uh, and for increased international support for building better systems. So it's locally and internationally, domestic and international, uh, better systems, including for the registration of deaths and other uh, vital uh, events. So as I say, this can be done now. The technology is there. Um, I think the problem is uh, just lack of trust in governments that they won't uh, abuse this data. So, so this is one of those interesting situations. So it means that humanity has the potential to massively improve its own health here, uh, providing the uh, motivations of everyone involved are what they should be. But of course, the problems are we know that we're dealing with human beings, so often they aren't. So um, whether this is ever going to be achieved is questionable. Because the technology to do it is one thing, but the technology to do it in a way that people can see that their own personal data is protected is much more difficult. But uh, a, potential, a potential massive improvement. And, and we are collecting a lot more uh, what we might call uh, meta metadata and megadata. These huge amounts of data, because if you had this, you could just have it all in front of you. And uh, academics could think, oh, I wonder what happens if we uh, improve water supply or something, tap in a few numbers, and you kind of get the result. Where, whereas in the past, you would have to do surveys that lasted for years. The, the, the opportunity for almost uh, an exponential growth in healthcare knowledge is currently here uh, due to the technology. The fact that you're watching me now, is, of course, is the amazing technology of a YouTube um, and, and there's somewhat less amazing technology that, that's surrounding me. Um, but the, the potential is there. Um, I'm just uh, not as optimistic that it will be profitably used, but, but it could be. But that's where we are, 14.9 um, million. So uh, excess deaths. OK, now in, in, in 2022, of course, we've been in Omicron times. Less uh, deaths, but nevertheless more than enough to put it well over the 15 million. Uh, this doesn't compare to the 40 to 80 million people that died in the 18, in the 1918, 1919 pandemic. 
uh, the, the ab- absolute figures are way lower. And of course, the world's population was massively less then. So percentage wise, in, in terms of real numbers, the death rate from the, the COVID pandemic is much less than that. And in percentage terms, it's way less than that. Um, and that's largely due to the nature of the virus, the way that the virus has evolved to become less pathogenic and more transmissible. Um, and as we've seen, rich income countries that spent a lot of money on uh, vaccines have actually ended up with a higher percentage of, of excess deaths than lower income countries where there was much lower vaccination rates. That doesn't mean to say that the vaccination program hasn't been effective. We believe, we, we believe we've got very strong evidence that it has. Um, but it does tell us something about um, rich countries just looking after their own interests. We have a lot to learn from each other. And uh, thank you for watching.